So how many of you are busy this morning? Anybody? Anybody got a lot going on? Yeah, uh-huh. That's a typical response that I get whenever I ask somebody, hey, how's, how's it going? How are you doing? The answer is typically, oh, I'm busy. I'm so swamped. I've got so much going on. I've got so much to do. I don't even know why I ask the question anymore because I'm pretty sure the response is going to be, man, I'm, I'm, I'm just busy. And I'm guilty of it too. Um, I don't think twice about it. Someone asks me, well, how are you doing? Oh, I'm busy. I'm working a lot. I'm doing this. I'm doing that. Um, but it's just so, so easy to give the answer because it's not wrong. We are. We're very busy people. And at the end of the day, everybody has something going on every minute of every day. Being busy or even just seeming busy is becoming an excuse for so many things. It's considered an, now a justification for, for not listening to what other people are saying. What you say? I'm sorry. I wasn't listening. I was doing this. Or it's an excuse for being late. I'm sorry. I was doing this. I was too busy doing this. Or for having a bad attitude, I'm sorry, I've been so busy lately, it's got me frustrated, it's got me a little upset, so, so please forgive me if I've been a little short-tempered. Or maybe even being too busy is an excuse for not getting anything done. A little bit of an ironic twist, isn't it? It appears that being busy is becoming the new way of saying, I don't have time for, for things. It's busy is the new distracted. So my question is to you this morning, what do you do with your time? Some years ago, the Bureau of Labor Stats published results of a survey on how Americans use their time. So they got, over the course of the year, 21,000 people to keep diaries of exactly what they did every day. And when I first read that, I was like, well, who has time for that? <laughs> and they had to keep track of what they did for 24 hours a day. And it makes you think, well, if they got time to do that, they must have time for other things. But here's what the st study showed us. During a 24-hour day, on average, you know, this is, you know, all ages, people who work and don't work, and, and a, a lot of different factors here. But each of us spend about eight and a half hours a day sleeping, meaning most of these people do not have kids. <laughs> about, about one and a half hours eating, so we know they didn't ask Baptists, and about 30 minutes exercising. And when people do work, they work about eight hours a day, which, which sounds about right. Now let's contrast that with a few other things. 2.6 hours a day watching TV. 45 minutes socializing with another person. That strike you as shocking at all? 45 minutes socializing or talking with another person? And only about eight minutes a day in time with God. Let that click for a second. Spend 2.6 hours watching TV, but only eight minutes a day with God. And that's an average. 18 times more. Look, there are plenty of reasons why many of us feel busy all the time. Maybe we don't have a lot of help. Uh, maybe we've got a lot of interruptions, distractions that, that really just run rampant and that have to be taken care of. Anybody in here work in the world of IT? Anybody in here do like help desk work or work for a company that does stuff with computers? Anybody at all? Okay, I see a couple people. Did you know that on average they get interrupted once every three minutes during their job day? Once every three minutes, someone doesn't know how to turn their computer on. Someone doesn't know how to do this. Someone doesn't know how to do that. It's probably my dad that, you know, that's calling and asking these questions. Um, but the study shows us that 75% of these interruptions get handled immediately whether the IT person feels like they're important or not because the other person feels like they're just crucial. And so they don't have an opportunity to prioritize. Maybe you feel that way with your life. There's interruption after interruption, something, after, something going on after something else going on, and you just don't have time to deal with the things that are important. You can't prioritize. Maybe it's time we introduce a new word into our lives called simplify. The Bible tells us over and over again, almost 200 times to be exact, that we are supposed to be experiencing joy in this life. That we are supposed to have joy, that our joy should be full, our, our joy in Christ should be going strong. But with all the chaos and tumultuous schedules that we go on, that we have going on, are we finding joy? Can you sit back and look at your life and look at your schedule and say, man, I'm joyful. Let's look at our scripture for today. It's a very 
fairly well-known account in Scripture, but I challenge you this morning to really focus, compare it to your life, take, take some steps to slow down, and really understand what is happening. Everybody turn with me to Luke chapter 10. We're going to look at Luke chapter 10, beginning in verse 38. I'm sure that uh, as you guys are are turning there, you may be thinking, okay, I know this story. I know what he's about to talk about. Bear with me. Let's talk this through. We're going to start in Luke chapter 10 and begin in verse 38. Now, as they went on their way, Jesus entered a village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. Okay, so we're going to stop there real quick. We're going to keep pausing in between each section here so we can really digest what's happening. So after performing miracles, after teaching the masses, after sharing the the story of the Good Samaritan, after sending out 72 people, 72 servants to do God's will, Jesus was ready ready to move on. So him and his disciples, they're on to the next town. And it's clear that they're traveling into the town of Bethany because that's where Martha, Mary, and Lazarus live. And he decided, hey, I'm going to pop in for a visit. I'm going to pop in and see Mary and Martha. And it says, Martha welcomed him into her house. Now look, this is a time when you cannot send an email ahead of time. Can't make a quick phone call. Didn't send somebody on camel real quick. But he wanted to come in and Martha welcomed him. Any of you ever have the pop-in guest? Do you dread those situations? You never tell that person that you don't want them there, but deep down inside it's gnawing at you like, why couldn't they have called? The house is a mess. Your kid just shoved a Cheerio in their nose. The dog's thrown up on the carpet. Dinner's burning, and then you get the knock on the door or the ring of the doorbell, and you just stop and be like, no. (laughs) Maybe you do get the courtesy call. Hey, we're in your driveway. Can, Can we stop by for a few minutes? For some, it's no big deal, but for others, their world just got a little bit more frantic. Now, let's add something to that. Let's say that visitor is Jesus, and Jesus isn't alone. Look, his disciples are with him. Great, now you're feeding a football team. So imagine Martha's mindset. Imagine what's going on in Martha's head when Jesus and and his disciples show up at, at her door. And so she welcomes him into their house. And as we read along in in verse 39, it it tells us that, And she had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. So given the situation at hand, Martha was all hands on deck. Jesus is here. His disciples are here. We have newfound work. We have newfound things that we need to do. We need to prepare some meals. We need to get them something to drink. They've been walking. They've got to be thirsty. And here's Mary pulling up a chair. Hey, Jesus, how's your walk? I think we've all been there, especially if you're married. I'm pretty sure that, you know, you have visitors and and your husband's doing something else other than helping. What do you do? Well, you start subtle, right? You start with the look. Every one of you know the look. You might be getting it right now. Just to try and get attention to say, hey, I need some help in here. Maybe helpful hints start happening. You're in the kitchen, drop a pan. Maybe you say, ouch. Maybe check and see what's going on. Or maybe you give the verbal hints. Oh, geez, look at all these empty cups that need filled up with water. It would be great if someone would pour these. I don't know how Martha reacted whenever she saw Mary, as soon as he got in, just sit down and and, and take a seat. But we know that she gets to the point where she's had enough. We get to the point where she knows she's had enough and it's time to interrupt. We've got to get this record set straight. Someone's not pulling their weight here. So we read on in verse 40. But Martha was distracted with much serving and she went up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her then to help me. You know, when I've read this story before, this is one thing I've I've never noticed, but Martha questions if Jesus cared. She didn't address Mary, who wasn't doing anything. She went straight to Jesus and says, don't you care? Let's think about that question for a second. I think Martha would want to take that one back. If it was me and not Jesus, I would have had a few things to say to her. 
But Jesus handled the frantic and frustrated Martha in an ideal way. Something that we can, we can learn from this. In verse 41, But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things, but one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion which will not be taken away from her. Jesus doesn't yell at her. He's not, Martha, Martha. No, it's Martha, Martha. Calm down. It's okay. He's not yelling at her. He kindly calms her down because he can see she's overwhelmed, she's stressed, she's frustrated. She might be exhausted. And then he points out to her, hey, only one thing is important right now. As if to say to Martha, one, don't scold your sister, but two, why don't you join your sister? Stop yourself. He wasn't saying, let Mary sit there and you go back and keep doing what you were doing. No, he was, he was saying, you know, Mary has chosen the good portion. In other words, you can do the same if you so choose. Sometimes we need to be reminded that the answer to joy and happiness in life is not based on how packed your schedule is. It's not based on how many hours you work, how many reports you get done. It's not based on how many service projects you do. It's not based on if you're doing a great job at juggling from going to this and to that and to all these other things. No, the answer is here in verse 42 that one thing is necessary. The answer to finding joy and happiness is stopping to spend time with Jesus. Stopping to spend time with Jesus. Not doing anything other than being with Jesus. The dishes can wait. The shopping trip can wait. Thanks to technology, with a DVR, TV can wait. Now, he's not telling us never to do anything. We know that would go against Scripture as well because we are to be laborers. We are to be fruitful with our labors. It says if a man is able to work and does not, he should not eat. So we know that we are supposed to work. We know we are supposed to do things. We know we are supposed to fellowship. We know we are supposed to spend time with family. He just got done telling the story of the Good Samaritan. So he's telling us, hey, we should be helpers. We should be servants. But we also need to make sure that we make time for the most important person, which is Jesus. I would like to think that we would stop, clear out our schedules to occasionally take our spouse out to dinner, or play with our kids, or go visit our parents, or, you know, when a friend comes in town that you haven't seen in a while, that you, you would clear some time for them. You, you know, you, you would cancel something for a situation like that but why don't we put Jesus on that same list? Why don't we put him at the top of that list? Why is he always the last minute thought? Why is he always the substitute because your plans got canceled? Well, I got some time. I might as well just crack open this Bible. Yeah, this Sunday's not too busy. I think I'll, I'll give, you know, I'll, I'll get to church. Why is he that last minute thought? You wonder why we have a hard time finding joy. I think the answer is clear. Think of the word joy as an acronym. And that acronym stands for Jesus, others, you. That is a good way to remember how to find joy. The only way you're going to find real joy in this life is to put Jesus first and focus on Jesus first and then put yourself last. And then you can actually find joy. How many of you have let your busyness, your packed schedule change who you are? You've become so overworked, so exhausted, so overwhelmed that you start developing resentment to the people who have the freedom to do fun things. You develop bitterness or you develop anger. Maybe you've become depressed because you feel like a mouse in a maze that can't get to the cheese. How many of you have let your chaos affect your relationships with your family, with your friends, and most importantly, your relationship with your Lord and Savior? I think it's time that we realize that our schedules can drain us. That our, if we don't slow down long enough to recover and to focus on our relationship with God, focus on us and Him, then we eventually become no good to anyone. How are you able to witness to somebody 
if your relationship with God is not strong. Because that's on, been on the back burner. Reading scripture is just out of the question right now. How are you able to confront a brother or sister in sin if we don't take care of our own sin problems? Because we're too busy to deal with our sin. Jesus made that clear in the Sermon on the Mount whenever he was talking about judging others and that says, why are you comparing about someone's speck in their eye when you have a log in yours? You wouldn't want a doctor who has the flu to treat you. No, I think I'll reschedule my appointment. That doctor needs to get better and take care of himself. Jesus is telling us we need to stop and take care of our relationship with him first. It's not a thing of selfishness. It's a thing of necessity. So my question is, are you taking the time to stop? Are you taking the time to refuel when you're running on empty? Does anyone know what happens to a car when you get, let the gas run way too low? Anybody a gaslight driver in here? You just let it get, let's see how far I can go. If you, if you watch Seinfeld, Kramer goes below the E. If you know what I'm talking about, they try to see how far you can push it before you absolutely have to get gas. Does anybody know what that does to your car? And yes, I'm guilty of it too. I follow the little estimated time before you fill up. Here's what happens, okay? Gasoline it acts like a coolant for your electric fuel pump and motor. So when you run very low, it allows the pump to suck in air. When you suck in air, it creates heat and it can cause your fuel pump to go bad. Does anybody know how much it takes to fix a fuel pump? It's not $1.60 a gallon, okay? So something that could be fixed easily with taking the time to stop and fill up for 30, 40 bucks turns into something that becomes a one, a hundreds of dollars expensive repair. You know, another effect of driving on a low tank is the risk of getting stranded or getting in an accident because your car suddenly stops running and you're in the middle of a, a big freeway, an intersection. I think you and I have seen people with their flashers on for that reason. Because people don't take the time to fill up. The same thing can happen to us in our lives. If we don't fill back up in our relationship with God, if we're running on empty, things can get a lot worse and be a lot harder to fix than if we would just address the problem and fill up. We wouldn't feel stranded. We wouldn't feel lost. We'd feel full, full of joy. So what are some things we can do to refuel? How do we fix this problem? There's tons of ways. I'm going to focus on three this morning. Isn't that what preachers do? Three? It's always in groups of three. We're going to focus on three today. Number one, and most important of them all, is focus on reconnecting with God. I know many of you say you feel better after going to church. You know, it's been a while. You finally get back in church, you leave, you're like, man, I'm really glad I went to church today. I know I've been there. You know, if I've been out for a while, I'm like, man, it feels good to be in church. It felt great to be in church. It felt good to worship. Do you realize that if you're reconnecting with God every day, that good feeling can be had every day? through prayer, through time in his word, through singing worship, through experiencing his creation. All of these things can happen despite the chaos of life. It's time that you find your spot, right? That place where you can go and spend at least 15 minutes with God. You know, that, it mentioned the average was eight. Some people don't even do eight. Some people do zero. Just spend some time with him. Go to a room, find a chair, sit in a parked car. It doesn't matter where it is, as long as God is the focus. And you can devote your time to him and not be distracted. What does 1 Thessalonians 5, 17 tell us? Pray without ceasing. And yet we can't find time to pray. We should pray without ceasing. Joshua 1.8 tells the importance of daily scripture reading. It says this, The book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For when you make your way prosperous, then you will have good success. What does it say? The key to good success is to being in the book, being in the word of God day and night. All of a sudden, the temptation that you just could not kick becomes manageable 
because you're focused on God, you're not focused on other things. All of a sudden, relationships with your family, with your friends, with coworkers get better because your focus is on God. That is the tank fill up right there. That is the biggest replenisher right off the bat. What else can, can we do? I mean, that, that first one's the most important, but what other things can we do? Number two is eliminate the problems. Eliminate the problems. For some of us, it may be our jobs. We have such dissatisfying jobs or, or jobs that we absolutely despise that it affects who we are because we work so long, we work all this overtime, we do this, we do that, and by the time we come home, we're just done. Dad, let's play, let's do this. I don't feel like it, I'm tired. Hey, let's sit down and eat dinner together. I think I'm just going to grab some food and go to bed. Ecclesiastes 5.18 gives us really wise words from King Solomon. It says, Behold, what I have seen to be good and fitting is to eat and drink and find enjoyment in all the toil with which one toils under the sun the few days of his life that God has given him, for this is his lot. Did you, did you hear that? Enjoyment in all the toil, that includes your job. Enjoyment in all the toil means do you enjoy all the things that make you busy, all the things that cause you to run late, all the things that cause you to miss this, all the things that cause you to miss that. Are you enjoying them the way God would, you intend, for, would intend for you to enjoy them, or do you just do them because that's in the schedule? I've got to do it, I've got to do it, and you develop a bitterness inside. Church life is short. It says it there, the few days of your life that God has given him. You may think, well, I've got... A hundred years, I've got 90 years. We don't know that. We don't know that we've got tomorrow. The Bible tells us that life is but a vapor. It does not last forever. I never really understood how quickly time does go because what is the first thing somebody tells you when you have a baby? Someone's even told me this morning, enjoy it while they're what? Little. Right? Enjoy them while they're young. Enjoy them while they're small because they grow up fast. I could have knocked out Kenny Betts because he's like, pretty soon she'll be driving. And uh, my daughter's only six months old. But to say only is, I can't say only. She's already six months old. And I didn't believe that talk until it's actually happened. I'm like, oh my goodness, she's doing this, she's doing that. And all these things are happening so fast. Life is short. So we need to enjoy the life that God has given us and do it the way he intended us to. Look, if your job is draining the life out of you day after day, putting you in a bad mood, causing you to be abusive, causing you to be hateful, then I hate to tell you, but it's probably time for you to find something else. Instead of living in the constant cycle of regret, it's time to get on your knees and ask God, either A, help you in the situation, change my attitude about my job to where I start to enjoy it more, to where things change for me on the inside, to where I don't come home bitter, so I don't come home angry, so I don't come home exhausted. Maybe some of that voluntary overtime you don't need, but you just do. Maybe you scale back on that a little bit. You ask God to say, you know, maybe I don't need to go to another place, but maybe I need to find a different department, a different shift, a different this or different that, that better fits. Or maybe it is, you need to find something different altogether. Pray for an opportunity in another job. Every, everybody's situation is unique and requires God's guidance. So don't say, well, he said go quit today. No. Talk to God. Maybe it's your own heart that needs to be changed, and it's not the job. But at the end of the day, if that's causing the busyness, or maybe it's something else that's causing your busyness, and you don't even enjoy it, and it begs the question, why are you doing it? Look, for me, back in February of 2015, I left a fantastic job. I left a fantastic job at a fantastic company because when I found out my wife was pregnant in January, I knew that this job would not be good for me. It may be great for everybody else. It may be great for others, but this isn't going to work for me. We waited so long failed adoption after failed adoption. We had waited so long. I was going to be the dad that's going to be there. I'm going to be the dad that's, that's going to have fun with my kid. I'm not letting work take priority of this little baby. 
And so after working for this company for four years, I put in my two weeks notice and went to something I wasn't really familiar with. Um, but I can look today and I'm right at a year. And I know God placed me there for a reason. I couldn't imagine being where I was before. This new job has given me the opportunity to be the best husband and father that I can be. Allowing me to put that priority where it needs to be. It gives me the opportunity to better serve our church and, you know, teach Sunday school better and more effectively to, to help in ministries and to do the different things that are more important to me. And God's blessed me, blessed me beyond measure in that because it had to make a change because otherwise I was miserable before. <clears throat> you got to take a step in faith. So first is obviously reconnecting with God. That's number one. Two, if you're reconnecting with God, then you should be able to go to him and pray and talk to him and receive guidance from him on how to slow down. What to do? What do I take out? What do I add in? How do I make time for you, God? What do you want me to get rid of? And third, probably a pretty exciting one, but take a break. Take a break. And I'm sure you guys are thinking, I can't take a break. I don't have time to take a break. 24 hours in a day, I need four more. That's not enough. I cannot relax. Does, does anybody even know how to relax anymore? Does anybody, some relax too much, but some of you don't know how to relax at all. If you were given time to do whatever you wanted for a few hours, what would it be? Would it be to take in a game, a baseball game with your family? Would it be to take a nap? Any nappers in here? I'm a napper. I could fall asleep like that. <laughs> Taking time just to spend time with your family, watching a movie together. Going out to a nice dinner with the person you love. That's not selfishness to take a break occasionally. Now your hobbies and your fun should not overtake your time with Jesus or time with your family. Your, um, your relaxation should not put you in debt and that wouldn't be a good steward of your money, obviously. But do everything within God's will. He wants us to enjoy life. And to enjoy life, sometimes we need to take a break. Did you know Jesus took breaks? He had to take breaks. He and his disciples had some very tiring days. Feeding 5,000 people. You know, preaching to the masses. Casting out demons. Let's look at Mark chapter 6 for a second. Mark chapter 6, beginning in verse 30. Starting in verse 30, it says, The apostles returned to Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. And he said to them, this is Jesus talking here, Come away by yourselves to a desolate place and what? Rest a while. For many were coming and going and they had no leisure even to eat. And they went away to a, in the boat to a desolate place by themselves. And if you read on in verses 33 and 34, now many saw them going and recognized them, and they ran on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. And when he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd, and he began to teach them many things. So while it didn't last long, Jesus took a break. People saw him like, there he is, and they're running on land while they're in a boat. And they beat him to it. They beat him to the spot. And Jesus wasn't mad because he knew they needed a shepherd. But the advice is here. What they did is here. Come away by yourselves to a desolate place and rest a while. Some people love vacations where you constantly doing something 24-7. You know, you go on vacation so we can do this, 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 and this. I like a vacation where I can just sit down. A cabin in the woods kind of thing. Not a cabin in the woods in Gatlinburg so you can only go there to sleep because the rest of the time you're in Gatlinburg eating and going to a show and doing this and that. I want a cabin where I can just sit on the porch and look at nature and, look at, and just watch God's creation. And Jesus says, look, after all this hard work, 
go to a quiet place and rest a while. They had been working so hard, they didn't even have time to eat. They didn't even have time to eat. Back in those stats I was telling you, you have the average is one and a half hours a day eating. Meaning that people take about 30 minutes per meal. 30 minutes for lunch, 30 minutes for dinner, 30 minutes for breakfast. If you even take time for breakfast. The going right nowadays, most people don't eat breakfast because they don't have time. They're rushing around too much. I don't have time for breakfast. I, I, this isn't going to work. I don't have time to eat. Did you, did you have lunch today? No, I didn't have time for lunch. I had meetings. I had all this. Did you have time for dinner? No, I was going to ball games. And you don't even have time to eat. And, and Jesus is telling his disciples and his, he's telling his apostles, look, all of this work, you haven't even had a chance to eat. It's time to rest a while. How many of you have been there? That's not healthy. So they went away to the boat, in the boat, to a desolate place by themselves. What a better place to go than out on the water where no one can get to you. They had to wait for him to get there. They took a break. So what's it going to be, church? You're at a crossroads this morning. You have two options. Chaos and chaos alone. Or chaos and joy, with joy being the priority. Look, you can ignore all of this. You can ignore the story of Mary and Martha. You can ignore the example in Mark and go back to the unrelenting schedules and the insanity and the craze. Or you could start chasing after joy, Jesus, others, you. It begins with the reconnecting with God daily followed by finding satisfaction in, in your work or in the things you do that are in that schedule, that are pleasing to God. And lastly, to be sure you pencil in rest. Because when you have the chance to refuel, you are better able to endure the hardships of life. You are more aware of the temptations that you face, and you are more focused on God with the ability to turn from those temptations. Others will benefit from the fact that you are refreshed because you're able to witness because you're actually in God's word. You have an improved attitude, meaning people will see the light in you. Your family sees the light in you because you're refreshed. Your coworkers say there's something different about this person because you're seeking joy, you're seeking Jesus serving others and refueling yourself. But at the end of the day, the choice is yours. You have to make the decision that I'm going to focus on God. Don't wait for, for God to send you an Outlook invite for a 30-minute meeting. Don't wait for that. <clears throat> He's waiting. He's ready to spend time with you. Maybe you felt that nudging. Maybe you felt the Holy Spirit telling you that for a while and a while and you've been ignoring it. God's saying, spend time with me. Not because he needs it. God doesn't need that. We do, and he knows that. You ever put something off just because you didn't feel like doing it, and then when you finally do it, you're so glad you did it? Same thing here. Quit putting it off. Reconnect with God. The choice is yours. What's it going to be? What is this week going to look like for you? Maybe coming in it was one thing and it was jam-packed. But maybe now you're thinking, you know, this can wait. This can slow down. This is not as important. What is important? My Jesus. What is important? Serving others. And what is important? Refueling myself. The choice is yours.